Farm. Family. Community. This is Midwest Farm Weekly. Good morning and thank you for joining us for Midwest Farm Weekly. I'm Melaine Wells. In your news headlines today, with fall harvest nearly on the horizon, the USDA released a crop progress and condition report for Wisconsin. Hot dry weather has been a theme over the last week and it will continue to be. Soil moisture is depleted with 0% of the state reporting a surplus. 21% of the corn is now dented. Condition of that crop is at 59% good to excellent. Soybeans are faring about the same when it comes to quality. 88% of that crop has set pods. Winter wheat is nearly wrapped up and fourth crop hay is moving along ahead of an average year. Farmers looking to test the moisture of their corn crop have several chances at upcoming corn dry down events. Farmers, agronomists and professional consultants should bring four to five stalks from each field for testing. There are a number of free events coming up. September 6th, Hedge of the Door County Co-op. September 7th, Jay Springs Dairy in Appleton. Kanigi Farms in Omro is the site on September 12th. On the 13th, you can head to Rio Creek Feed Mills Luxembourg location. The 14th, testing happening, ha happening at Crop Source in Freedom. And you can see a full list of upcoming dry down events in the Midwest Farm section of wearegreenbay.com. The U.S. Department of Agriculture has awarded Wisconsin more than $1.3 million to enhance the competitiveness of specialty crop products and to create new market opportunities for our state's specialty crop producers. Thirteen projects will share these funds, including research on honeybees and how to improve the quality of pollen collected. Another effort aims to grow the Farm Fresh Atlas, which is a guide for shopping local food. You can see a full list of the projects getting the funding at Midwest Farm section of wearegreenbay.com. Wolves are making a comeback in Europe, but not everyone is happy. So a new kind of shepherd is roaming the mountains to make sure everyone gets along. CBS's Ian Lee reports. A battle of life or death is playing out in the Swiss Alps. Shepherd Mathis von Sippenthal and his trusty dog keep an eye on their grazing sheep. That's because wolves roam these mountains. Mostly it's like the wolf is coming for two, three days and yeah. then he's gone. Vigilance is key here, not only to save Mathis's 480 sheep, but the wolves too. The predators are making a comeback in many European countries after being wiped out over a century ago. Volunteers help keep watch, camping out with night vision goggles and a sturdy heart, ready to cry wolf at a moment's notice. You can't be scared. One person tracks the wolves while the other approaches them with a powerful flashlight and whistle to chase them away, says this cardiologist. Last year, wolves killed nearly 1,500 animals in Switzerland. So hundreds of volunteers try to keep the peace. We deterred wolves from flocks 32 times, and these are situations where attacks could have happened, he says. For Mathis, the extra help gives him peace of mind that his sheep and livelihood are safe. For me, it's, it's such a big help because, like, yeah, I'm, I'm nearly the whole day outside with them and herding them, and then I bring them back. And then it's nice to to go down and, and have a rest. Coming together to make sure man, sheep and wolf can live in harmony in these majestic mountains. Ian Lee, CBS News. In Wisconsin, a revised wolf management plan has been released by the DNR and it will go before the Natural Resources Board in October. Perhaps you've heard of the Master Cheesemaker program here in Wisconsin. Our state is the only one in America to require a license to make cheese, and this takes it to another level. But did you know that cheesemakers must master each style of cheese individually? When it comes to mozzarella and provolone, one of the best cheesemakers in the state comes from Luxembourg. I was invited to tour the plant with Pat Dell. It really starts with good quality milk. So first I have to thank our farmers, um, our milk haulers uh, that deliver the milk to our plant that allows us to make these cheeses. AgriPeer's Luxembourg plant works with 70 local farmers to take in 3.75 million pounds of milk every day, roughly 470,000 gallons. You know, we make cheese for uh, 20 hours in the, in the day here at this plant. Um, four hours to, to clean the plant and turn it around and then, and then start up on, on milk again. The plant makes two main types of cheese, 
Provolone, um, a lot of that's used for a slicing uh, type cheese. Mozzarella is going to be more for pizza. They also make small batches of cheddar for their famous squeaky cheese curds. Uh, we kind of do it the small, old uh, time, uh, traditional way um, uh, for our cheese store. So we do make uh, curds uh, twice a week here. Um, we have them fresh in our cheese store on Mondays and Fridays. Relying on tradition is important to Dell's recipe for success. As you look at, at Wisconsin and, and the dairy heritage that we have in Wisconsin, that kind of holds true for me. Um, I'm a fourth generation cheesemaker. Uh, my family has been making cheese for over 100 years, um, and I'm continuing with that uh, um, now at, at A Group here. The plant was built in 1892 as Crone Dairy. Growing up uh, definitely played a part in, uh, um, for me, uh, you know, as being a cheesemaker and, and uh, continuing on, on with it. You know, living next door to the plant, I grew up, I got to see it as, as a kid. Uh, work with my uncle for uh, 25 years. And just like Uncle Roger Crone, Pat earned his Master Cheesemaker certification in 2014. And Wisconsin is the only state um, that has a program um, of this, and it's based off of a European uh, program. Um, one, you have to be a licensed cheesemaker uh, for 10 years uh, before you can even enter into the program. Uh, you have to make in the varieties that you are going to uh, be a master in for uh, five years, I believe it is. Once you're accepted into the program, then it's a three-year program uh, where you take several courses um, down at the Center for Dairy Research in Madison. Dell and his team of 170 played a major role in the 19 awards Agripure earned at the most recent U.S. Championship Cheese Contest. It's a sense of satisfaction. Um, that we're being recognized for the quality of cheese we're making in these award-winning cheeses. As Agar Pier and as, as cheesemakers, um, this is what we do. Uh, cheese is our work, um, it's our passion, it's our commitment uh, to quality, our customers, our community, and the dairy industry. In addition to being sold to distributors, there are two main retail outlets for the cheese that's made in Luxembourg, on site at Crone Dairy Store, and Simon's Specialty Cheese in Little Shoot. For our Saturday viewers, a heads up, there is a fundraiser happening tonight for you at the Shano County Fair. Check out the silent auction during the Junior Dairy Show and a live auction at 6.30 right before the Dairy Futurity Show. This group is raising funds for kids to compete in national competitions in both Dairy Judging and Dairy Quiz Bowl, as well as continued support of exhibiting at the Wisconsin State Fair each year. Roughly 25 youth dairy enthusiasts will benefit from the proceeds. Welcome back to Midwest Farm Weekly. A new network of weather stations is beginning to come online in Wisconsin. Local 5's Ryan Kudish explains how farmers will benefit. Thunderstorms, blizzards, tornadoes, and strong winds are all significant weather events that disrupt day-to-day -day life. But a new network of weather stations, kick-started by the University of Wisconsin through outside funding, is coming to the area. Chris Vygasky, manager of the WiscoNet, says these stations will collect a variety of useful data, including temperature, wind speed and direction, liquid precipitation, solar radiation, leaf wetness, and many more. There are currently 14 stations within this network, with four more planned by the end of 2023, with the plan to have a grand total of 90 to 105. When asked about his goals for the project, one thought came to mind, decision making. This project is really going to help us know what to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Having a weather station within a, a few miles of your house is gonna help you to better understand, do I need to water my grass? Is the, the soil too dry? Do I really need to water my plants? Along with decision-making, Vygasky says this network of stations will be helpful to the farming industry in Wisconsin with the emphasis on saving money. We are gonna be providing all sorts of data and models that can benefit the growers um, so they can better be prepared for pests, uh, for diseases, to improve their irrigation, to save money. Over at the National Weather Service office in Green Bay, forecasters yeah, like Kurt Kotenberg say this mesonet will help day-to-day -day forecasting operations. So having this mesonet and all this extra information is going to be hugely helpful for our severe weather operations. By having this huge observational network, basically if we have a line of storms coming across Wisconsin from west to east, 
we'll be able to track uh, the winds that they're producing on the ground and that'll really help us in issuing warning. This project seeks to add 20 to 25 stations a year and is expected to take three and a half years. In Sturgeon Bay, Ryan Kudish, Storm Team 5. And to find available data, you can head over to wearegreenbay.com. Or you can just keep it right here. We have our own data digester. Ryan is with us in studio. Great story, Ryan. And I'm sure you're excited to tap into some of that as well. Oh, I'm excited. It's going to be very, very important to just tracking some data and also kind of help us with this climatological data as well. However, right now, our average high temperature is around 77 degrees and our average low temperature is 56 degrees for the end of August and our average rainfall sits for this month at around three and a half inches of rain. Now, where are we in terms of the year so far? So we're at this season, we're at 21.68 inches, just a hair below where there are average of around just below 22 inches of rain. Again, what we've been seeing a lot lately is we are well below where we're at at this time last year and kind of the same trend for uh, this month of August as well. We are right on average, this is really good to see, but again, way below where we were at in the year of 2022. We were at four and a half inches of rain at this time. So drought monitor that was just released on Thursday, very little changes to it. We are seeing still some extreme drought conditions and looks like Green Lake County, Washera County, and it looks like Marinette County, uh, Marquette County as well. Otherwise, here in Brown County, we are still hovering right near dry to uh, right at normal in terms of our drought monitor. So how much rain are we going to get over the next 10 days or so? Not a whole lot. Looks like the GFS model over the next 10 days giving us right around a half an inch of rain across much of our area. So a very dry stretch ahead of us. And this Climate Prediction Center over the next 8 to 14 days is indicating that, putting us below normal between September 7th and se September 13th for our precipitation. Now temperature trend, we are going to see some warm, warm weather through Sunday and Tuesday. We'll have those temperatures into the 90s and then back down to near average, but still that's going to be associated with this El Nino phase that we're going to be seeing across our area and the Climate Prediction Center has put us what they've likely chance to be above normal in their 8 to 14 day outlook looks to be between September 7th and again September 13th. So we're heading into September. Here's what the Climate Prediction Center is putting in terms of our precipitation outlook, putting us below normal for much of September. Looks like above normal for some of our, on the southern portions of the East Coast. And here's a look at our temperature outlook. Looks like we'll be right near normal average for our September temperatures for this month. So as we head into September, expect above average temperatures and we'll have some below average temperatures for us here in Northeast Wisconsin. Well, Jeremy Hansen here from Fox Valley Technical College for Life on the Farm. And joining me today is Lindsay Hartfield. Lindsay, thanks so much for talking with me today. And, and Lindsay, you know, you are from the University of Wisconsin Discovery Farm, correct? Correct. And first of all, tell me what you do there. Yeah, so the Discovery Farms program is part of UW-Madison Division of Extension. And we, it's an on-farm research program. So we work with private farm landowners and we monitor water quality on their farm, whether that be tile drainage, uh, surface water, or below the ground looking more towards looking at groundwater. Right. And that's why you're here talking with me and Kelly and County today at, at a field day. And you are um, talking about a pan lysimeter, correct? Correct. And I said that correctly, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. And first of all, what are you trying to measure? Or actually, why, why is that pan lysimeter actually installed in this field? So we have these pan lysimeters here in this particular field because nitrate in the groundwater is a concern in this area. They actually have pretty high nitrate in their groundwater. Uh, there's a safe drinking water standard at 10 milligrams of nitrogen per liter. And in this area, they're seeing nitrate concentrations above that. Right. So can you describe a little bit about what a pan lysimeter actually is then? Yeah, so these pan lysimeters, it is kind of what it sounds like in terms of it's, it's a pan. Um, and it gets installed below the ground, about a little bit more than three feet below the ground, closer to like three and a half feet below the ground. And we have them installed below undisturbed soil profile. So everything above that lysimeter has been untouched. The soil is just how it was when we, when we came into the field to install it. Um, so we installed into the side of the soil profile, put the lysimeters in, and these lysimeters then, they work to collect water that's moving through the soil profile to give us an idea of 
one, how much water is moving through that soil profile getting towards groundwater, and then what's in that water. Um, so we're looking at nitrate, like I said, and also chloride. Right, and you know, so how, how are the samples collected then? So with these lysimeters, we have to apply a suction to the, the lysimeter. If we don't have that suction, then the, uh, if we don't have that suction, then the water just kind of moves around that lysimeter because uh, the soil likes to hold on to the water. So if that lysimeter isn't matching the amount of suction that that soil profile has, it'll just go around it and stay in the soil. So we match with sensors what that suction level in the soil is and that will get the water into the lysimeter itself. And then about every two weeks, we'll have someone come out and collect the samples. So they have a pump that runs that's connected back to that lysimeter and it'll pull the water out of, the, out of that pan lysimeter. And there, there's also a bunch of technology, you know, associated with all this as well, right? There is, yep. There's a control, what we call a control box. It's a white box at the edge of the field. And that's really the brains of the operation. It's where all the sensors come back to and communicates with the, the data loggers in there to figure out how much suction to apply and how often it needs to apply that suction. Right. And even there's like a, even a miniature weather station and stuff that, that, that's, that's all hooked into everything as well, correct? Yep, there's a weather station here so we get what the moisture level in the soil profile is, temperature of the air, humidity, mm -hmm. rainfall, all that information as well. Right. And finally, what, what is uh, the life expectancy? I mean, just a couple months like this summer has been probably horrible for samples for you, but how long is this supposed to be in the soil for you guys? We're expecting somewhere in the five to seven year range, um, but we'll see once we get to that five to seven years if, the, if they're looking like they're still running good, if we can keep collecting samples, um, then we, we could probably keep do, do doing that because it's a lot of upfront work for the installation. So if they keep living and keep working, then we'll keep monitoring. Right. And just to monitor the nitrate that's going through the soil profile. Correct. Well, Lindsay, thank you so much for your time today. This, you were very informative in your presentation today. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation to be a part of this. Yes, my pleasure. So for Life on the Farm, I'm Jeremy Hansen. Welcome back. She is a pro at capturing all of the activities at the fair on camera and certainly beyond. Linda Walker is joining us with a peek at some of her gorgeous work from the recent Brown County Fair. Good morning to you. Good morning. How are you? I'm fantastic. I was having a hard time picking which pictures of yours to show because you did an incredible job of telling the fair story. Thank you very much. How did you get into photography? Um, it's always been a passion of mine. Um, I used to do wedding videography and it just kind of flowed out into photography. Um, I started doing portraits and I've done a number of other subjects, but I really enjoy doing events and the fair just seemed to be a good fit for me. You said specifically the rodeo really excited you. I love it. Absolutely love it. What is it about capturing action that is, is a challenge, I'd imagine, for a photographer? It is a very much a challenge. Um, you have to be ready to go when they're ready. <laughs> you have to, um, there are some safety features that you have to be aware sure. of. You know, don't put your camera inside the the um, arena because the horses and oh, yeah. whatever they come yes. by and boy yes. I tell you, that could be a tragic ending but um, I really enjoy it. Um, uh, the fair has been great to me to allow me two nights to do the to do their photography and uh, the pictures turned out awesome. And night photography is also something that you should be very proud of. That is also not easy to capture. It's not easy at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's um, your camera settings you really have to know your yeah. camera um, and it's um, one of those things where if you get into a situation, you just have to crank up your ISO and hope for the best. Well, Cece, you're already speaking a language that I'd imagine a lot of us don't understand. We all have cameras in our pocket, right, on our phone that we take yes. a lot of pictures with. Yep. But Linda, make the case for me of hiring someone to professionally capture your event, whether it is a fair or a cow show or simply your family story at your farm. I think it all depends upon what they're looking for. Um, and I think that they need to do their research into different photographers. Um, what have they done? What's their history? Yeah. What can they do for you? And that's really a great point to, to be aware of. And having someone who's dedicated to watching for those moments, right? If you're planning or hosting an event, you oftentimes don't have time to do that yourself. You don't. You don't. Um, you know, a lot of times uh, photographers will reach out to different events, mm -hmm. um, different organizations, um, and that's a great way for them to get their name out there. 
Um, and I did that with the Brown County Fair, and it's, it's, to me, it was a match made in heaven. Yeah, well, certainly on their Facebook page and yours, we can see much more of your work. Go find yourself, find your family members, because chances are, if you were at the fair, you might be showing up in some of these pictures. Linda is new to the Green Bay community, so you're going to see her work starting to pop up everywhere. We'll have a link to her website on ours. Thanks for joining us and for giving us a glimpse of your talent. Thank you very much. We'll see you guys next weekend on Midwest Farm Weekly.